Hi everyone, this is a very late book haul. That's for June. Um, obviously I was on holiday at the end of the month and I've been busy and it's hot. Got myself a bottle of Lucas Aid. Now, when we were kids, you only had this when you were ill. Now, oh, I'd love it, it's so refreshing. No makeup, it's too hot for makeup, it just melt off me. Now, I know it's not that hot compared to certain places in the world, but people who live in the UK know that our heat is horrendous because the humidity is high. And our houses aren't built for it, so we have no air con. And I don't like the summer. Well, that's not true. I like the summer, I just don't like it when it gets too hot. Like Monday's supposed to be horrendous, maybe even 36 degrees, which for here is very, very hot. To the point that they're talking about closing the schools, because again, no air conditioning. Anyway, so the first thing I'm going to show you are two little pamphlety books I got. They're Marilyn related, and they are these the Marilyn Monroe a Book Covers Collection. I've got issues one and five, she says if she turns it around. Now these are books but I'm not putting them into the reading challenge because all they are are photos of covers of magazines that Marilyn appeared in. But it's nice to see these covers and of course it's very nice to have this for my Marilyn collection. So there's those, my brother got me one for my birthday. Um, so one book I added this month which I'm not keeping um, is the Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. This was going to be this my was my classic for the month of June. Basic just says it's a troubled story of crime, sin, guilt, punishment, and expiation set in the rigid moral climate of 17th century New England. The young mother of an illegitimate child confronts her Puritan judges. However, it is not her harsh sentence so much as the cruelties of slowly exposed guilt as her lover is revealed that hold the reader enthralled all the way books to the poignant climax. So yeah. Uh, if I do my reading wrap up I will let you know what I think about it and the only reason I'm thinking not is getting late into the month and I read 36 books in June I will try and do it but uh, with Jennifer it's, it's hard to get stuff done and the heat obviously the heat um, the second book I bought which I will be keeping is The Earth Witch this is by Louise Lawrence now the story behind this is Paul told me he read this in school and he hated it didn't understand it. It's a book about Welsh mythology and stuff like that, but it's a story. So I thought, I've got to get it. I loved it personally. So it basically says, There was a presence in the valley. Some untamed spirit walked abroad, rustling her skirts with the morning. The birds sang her praises, and Owen was filled with a strange excitement. He could feel her close to him, but the sun was in his eyes, and she stayed hidden. She was the lapwing calling him, bewitched, bewitched. He took the glistening lane up Munnoth Blyna and followed her. So at first, Bronwyn Davis appeared to be a bitter middle-aged woman living reclusively with a vicious black dog in the run-down cottage on Munnoth Blyna. But once Owen's conscience had made him lend her a hand with repairing the cottage and clearing her garden, Bronwyn started to become younger and more beautiful and to him, and he found himself so craving the wild food and water she gave him he could eat nothing else. Spring passed and early summer saw Owen move up the mountain to live with Bronwyn Davis. No one could understand what had come over the boy. They knew he was a decent and good-hearted, not Auntie Glad or Uncle Ifer who had raised him, not Jonathan or Kate who were friends. But for Owen all that mattered was being with Bronwyn, close to the virgin in earth, until he learned what Bronwyn wanted of him and just how deeply she was a part of nature. The cycle of life and death. In this poignant novel about man's debt to the earth, Louise Lawrence evokes superbly the turn of the seasons in the hills of Wales and the anguish of a boy swept up in the beauty and horror of mythical forces. It is very, very beautiful. Because of that, this is what I'd say. The very first paragraph reads as such. There is not much left of Munnoth Blyna, just dark trees along the ridges of the hills, such a shadow of an older darkness, and in the minds of local people, a vague unease. She was a forest once of ancient trees, grey ash, green beech, the dancing birch and the bright red buried rowan. Not much remains, only a tree bowl rotting in a tangled garden, only a gnarled oak in an open field, and in Langwern a clump of alders. The river runs through open farmland now, where once it ran through a branched and brooding shade. It slides through water meadows where the cattle graze. But willows have regrained the withy beds, and she was mad and muttering who lived in Blina Cottage by the forest edge. They buried her a year ago beneath the clay. She is a bramble growing on a mould of bones, on a mound of bones. She is a creeping root remembering. I just think that's just so beautiful, the imagery. You see, see how sweaty I am. But isn't that beautiful? So that's The Earth Witch by Louise Lawrence. 
so I got, uh, are they all? Right, yes. The next few books are Hollywood related. I've got two factual books and one uh, fiction. The first one is Villain or Victim, the real story behind one of Hollywood's most notorious tragedies, Fatty, and it's by Andy Edmonds. Now, Andy Edmonds wrote Hot Toddy about Thelma Todd, um, so I'm not sure it's going to be 100% accurate, but I, I wanted to read it. He was the hot new favourite of the silver screen. He was called the bal Balloonatic, the Prince of Wales. In 1921, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle was the highest paid film comedian of his day. He had three films in the can and was happily married and at the peak of his success. Then on 5th of September, he threw a lavish open house party to celebrate his new $3 million Paramount contract. It was at a party that got wildly out of hand and ended abruptly when a starlet named Virginia Rapay let out a terrifying scream. What happened next has touched off nearly 70 years of speculation. Some claim in fact he assaulted Virginia Rapay with a champagne bottle. Others maintain that he was nowhere near her when she screamed. In any case, Rappé died five days later after the incident and Arbuckle was charged with first-degree murder and railroaded through three trials before finally being acquitted. By this time, his million-dollar career was devastated and his life in ruins. What was the truth? Recreating the glittering Hollywood of the 1920s, Andy Edmonds drew on completely new, hitherto unrevealed evidence to determine what really happened behind the scenes. Why, for example, did the key witness lie and then escape perjury charges? What sinister role was played by Paramount Chief and Adolf Zucker? And could Fatty Arbuckle have been the innocent victor victim of a frame-up? Based on evidence from the Paramount archives on personal interviews with Ar Arbuckle's first wife and Paramount staff and on Arbuckle's previously unpublished account of what happened at that fateful party, this truly fascinated investigative work at last tells the real and tragic story. So yeah, I'm getting really into early Hollywood. I've always been interested in it, but really starting to collect books on it now. And going on with that, one of his co-stars with the fantastic, fabulously lovely Mabel Normand. So I have Mabel Normand, The Life and Career of a Hollywood Madcap, and this is by Timothy Dean Leffler. So I'm just going to take a quick sip of Lucozade because I'm thirsty. So this basically tells the story. American silent film star Mabel Normand, 1892 to 1930, appeared in a string of popular movies opposite the likes of Charlie Chaplin and Fatty Arbuckle during the 1910s and 1920s, before dying of tuberculosis at the age of 37. Her brief but remarkable career, which included director and writer credits as well as heading her own studio and production company, was marred by a scandal. Police connected her to the unsolved 1922 murder of director William Desmond Taylor, that defined her legacy. This book highlights Norman's substantial yet long overlooked contributions to film history and popular culture, tracing her life from humble beginnings on Staten Island to the heights of world superstardom. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that one. And again, in keeping with the theme, we have The Long Silence by Gerard O'Donovan. This is a 1920s Hollywood noir mystery. And this one... February 1922, Hollywood is young but already mired in scandal when leading movie director is murdered. Irish-American investigator Tom Collins is called in by studio boss Max Sennett, whose troubled star Mabel Normand is rumoured to be involved. But Normand has gone missing and as Collins discovers there's a growing list of suspects, his quest leads him through the brutal heart of the Prohibition era Los Angeles, from speakeys and dope dens to the studios and salons of Hollywood's fabulously wealthy movie star elite, and to a secret so explosive it must be kept silent at all costs. Inspired by the unsolved real-life murder of movie director William Desmond Taylor, the long Long Silence is the first in a richly evocative, instantly compelling series of new noir mysteries set in Hollywood's early days. So I will be having a look to see if there's any more out and uh, picking them up. Right, we're going to move on now from um, Hollywood to two books by mortician Caitlin Doughty. So yeah, yeah. I like Caitlin Doughty. I think she's very funny. So we've got two books. So the first one is Will my cat eat my eyeballs? And other questions about dead bodies. So basically the back says, Can we give Grandma a Viking funeral? Why don't animals dig up all the graves? Will my hair keep growing in my coffin after I'm buried? Every day funeral de director Caitlin Doughty receives dozens of questions about death. Here she offers her factual, hilarious and candid answers to 35 of the most interesting, sharing the law and science of what happens to 
and inside our bodies after we die. Why do corpses groan? What causes bodies to turn strange colours during decomposition? And do and why do hair and nails appear longer after death? The answers are all within. It's really not morbid, it's not grotesque, it's just funny. And the second book is Caitlin's last book, I believe. I don't think there's another one out yet. Hopefully she'll be writing some more soon. And this one is called From Here to Eternity. And this was as a practical mortician. Caitlin Doty has long been fascinated by our pervasive terror of dead bodies. In From Here to Eternity, she sets out in search of cultures unburdened by such fears. With curiosity and morbid humour, Doty enjoy introduces us to inspiring death care innovators, participates in powerful death practices, almost entirely unknown in the West, and explores new spaces for mourning, including a futuristic glowing Buddha columbarium in Japan, a candlelit Mexican cemetery, and America's only open-air pyre. In doing so, she expands our sense of what it means to treat the dead with dignity and reveals unexpected possibilities for our own death rituals. So, the thing with Caitlin Doty, she is trying to take people's fear of death away um, long before the Victorians, and including the Victorians, people always cared for their dead at home. They would wash and dress them at home, and then the funeral directors took over and, and all the bodies were embalmed and preserved, and they took it away from the families and made it into some kind of mystery, which it isn't and it shouldn't be. So all she's trying to do is take away that fear and encourage people to seek the best death that they can, because the one thing's guaranteed in this world we're all going to pass on at some point. I know what my dad wants when he passes. I know what I want when I pass. Um, I've told Paul and he's aware of it. And I will make sure that my dad's, dad's wishes are carried out. He's not afraid of it. I'm not afraid of it. I don't want to die. Who wants to die? But there's no point in being afraid. It comes to I know what it is. It's the fear of be, there being nothing after. Not so much dying is that there's nothing after. Anyway, so I do recommend anything by Caitlin Doty. I haven't read this one yet, but I will be reading it very, very soon. So those are the seven, um, nine technically with the two Marilyn books that I bought in June. Um, I will be reading them all soon because, you know, Hollywood, can't leave that hanging around for too long. Um, my wrap up is going to contain 36 books if I do it. Do you really want me to sit here and talk about 36 books? If you do, let me know in the comments below and I'll get it filmed as soon as I can. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you soon. Bye peeps.